<lacht> Willkommen zurück auf Laser Guckenland, dem Vanilla Anarchie Server. Und äh, heute gibt es ein Video von Sha 2017. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, wie für Sha steht. Vielleicht irgendwas mit Shark, keine Ahnung. Also der YouTube-Channel ist Sha 2017, hat äh, 1800 Abonnenten. Wir schauen ein Video mit 12.000 Klicks von 2017 mit dem Titel Network Concepts Introduction and Why Shark Workshop Sha 2017 von Kirillis Solovsivs. Ich denke, der Dude wird seinen Namen besser pronouncen, wenn das Video losgeht. Und zwar jetzt. Das Ganze dauert zweieinhalb Stunden. Vielleicht machen wir heute eine Folge in Rekordlänge. Ähm, aber ich würde sagen, let's go. Mal sehen, wie viel wir von dem Video schaffen. So there are some knowledgeable people here, um, and I'm sure those of you who I don't recognize also are knowledgeable. Please help your neighbors to install Wireshark. It's Wireshark.org, right? So you have it all. If you don't have a laptop, um, it may be less interesting for 30% of the talk, but 70% is going to be me talking, right? Okay. But having said that, even though it's a hacker approach, I come from an academic background, so. The goal of this talk is to make you really, really, really understand all the layers of, of the networking and how it all adds up and how internet works. Yo, party people! And have you the Wireshark already installed? Are you ready? Okay. So this is these are actually two models of how networking works, and we're going to go through the layers one by one. What this represents? Oh. How many of you know what an IP? Sorry. How many of you know what an IP address is? Okay. How many of you have aren't sure what an IP address is? And that's okay. That's what this workshop is aimed for. One. Some more. Okay. Okay. Good. So, how many of you have seen a similar picture to this one before? Okay. A bit more than half. Okay. Good. So, but this is. A I tried to make it a beginner's one, okay, but let's, let's do it like that. Ready. So the wire, or the network medium, is down here. What this represents, actually, is the different ways, or different dissectors that we can use to look at the data on the network. If we take good old classical wire network, this is where the wire goes. This is where your electrical signals go, or your optical signals. And different encodings are used to encapsulate the data up to the user. So for this picture, and you're going to see it again today, you can imagine the user or yourself on the top where you're sitting at the keyboard in your browser, at your, in your email client, and the physical medium, the wire or the Wi-Fi on the very bottom. Okay? And we will get back to that. So what we're going to be talking about are the network layer models. We're going to take a look at Ethernet, we're going to take a look at Wi-Fi, it's going to take three hours. Uh, we're going to take a look at layer three protocols, those are layers, the seven layers in, in one of the modules, but we're going to take a look at that. Uh, we're going to look at ARP, ICMP, IPv4, IPv6, we're going to look at layer four UDP and TCP. How many of you aren't sure or don't know at all the difference between UDP and TCP? If I ask you to explain how many of you could not do, the, do that or would, wouldn't be sure if they could do that? Okay, we have beginners here, great! Cool. I really love that. Okay. We're going to have a quick peek at routing, I think, if I didn't remove that from the deck. Uh, and finally, application level protocols. Do you actually know the common thing between SMTP, which is used to send your mails online, and the post office? The return address is whatever you write on the envelope. It's the same for SMTP, same for email. You're going to look at that. 
And of course, the advanced stuff. Punching holes and firewalls, breaking VPI2, and Hör? much more. Because we have a lot of time. Gibt's die nicht mehr? Bin ich blöd oder right. was? The approach. Academic approach. And the same time, hacker approach. I already covered this. Das ging doch mal so. We'll try to understand it deeply enough. And we'll try to make it fun. Please make sure all of you have wire cards. Gibt's die echt nur noch mit Barren? Ist ja lame. Should first ask questions later. And the first thing we do is uh, we get to know Wireshark. So we're not going to go deep right now, we're just going to take a quick peek, and then we're going to discuss what we see, and then we're going to go deeper in all the protocols. Right? Uh, I didn't tell you what network is. Is there is there a need to explain what network is? Uh, network is generally yeah, but it's more than one awesome, connected right? devices. It's very general definition. Because it doesn't have to be a computer network, it, it, it yeah, can be USB and, and, and all that. And Wireshark, as we will see, is actually quite good at capturing the different protocols, not only network protocols, right? But computer network is basically a network that's made up of these layers that we uh, looked previously. Okay, I'm gonna sit over there. I'm gonna open okay, Leute, I must kurz nachschauen, wie man diese uh, goldenen Äpfel macht, weil das das kann ja jetzt nicht sein hier, oder? Was sagt ihr? Also nicht, dass ich die brauche, aber ich habe halt irgendwie Bock drauf. Paper? Echt jetzt? Echt jetzt? Paper? Is it uh, it's not all louder? Louder, yes. Loud enough? Okay. I think I, I ought to clean my Wireshark settings, not to show stuff. Hätte man auch davor machen können, Profi. <laughs> no hate natürlich, Leute, no hate. Okay, haben wir ein bisschen Papes am Start hier? In der Kiste, oder? Die Pape-Kiste, okay, let's see. Anyway, so, so Wireshark glaubt ihr, dass das funktioniert? That to yeah. Yeah. Das dachte ich mir nämlich auch, dass das nicht funktioniert. Ich wurde ja sowas von weggescampt. Paper? Ach so! Ah! Und ein Chart sind Golden Apple. Haha! Aber wo kriege ich den her? Ist a rare variant. Aber woher kriege ich denn jetzt? Wo ist denn der Obtaining? Obtaining. Ja, ich weiß, ich brauche ziemlich lange, um zu recherchieren, wie man einen scheiß Apple bekommt. Oh mein Gott. Cookies. Oh, die muss man finden. Ah. Und früher mit Blocks of Gold. Ja, ja kommt wieder der Oldschool Player raus. Okay, finden, verstehe. Weiter geht's bei 6 Minuten 30 Sekunden. Uh, to visualize network traffic. It can also be used to capture network traffic. I should have had Wireshark folder. Okay, whatever. Let's just let's just launch it. There will be some files in there, but it doesn't matter. Oh, it goes it goes in there. Um, Ich 
Jungs, der Dude atmet aber hart in sein Mikrofon, das bin ich ich, Leute. <lacht> Nur wenn du mit dir Bescheid wirst. Junge, Junge. Let me set the screens up for us. Okay. So, wir sind bei 7 Minuten und 47 right, Sekunden. So this is a, actually a clean, clean copy of my card. And depending on what version you got and what operating system you got, it might look a bit differently. But the common thing is you have a filter entry here, it allows you to enter filters. Uh, you have interfaces here. Uh, some operating systems are really picky about getting you, giving you access to the actual network interfaces. Uh, if you don't see them, uh, this graph doesn't show up in all the versions, right? If you don't see them, ask a neighbor to enable the capturing for you. You will have time to do that. Anyway, this is a general interface. And one thing, one thing I can suggest even to pros. Look, if I if I click on the interface, it starts it starts capturing the data. Um, yeah, let's let's capture it. Whatever. So this is my data that's on the wire. And uh, it's not it's not so easy to see because you, you you have these different parts and we can talk about them. What I suggest everyone do is go to preferences, edit preferences, and uh, in layout under appearance select the second layout. It's much easier to work with, it, right? Then we have it like here. Uh, why is this good? Because the left side and the right side now is showing the same information, different view. It's much better. Uh, so edit preferences, yeah, appearance. Yeah, and then layout, Schmerz, and you take the second, second option there. If you don't like it, you can switch back. Okay, so we'll talk about what all these numbers and all these letters mean in a moment. But what you need to know now, and if I'm going too far, please, uh, please let me know. We have time, at least for now. On the top, we have... Uh, well, you better not. But you can, and it, it, if you run Wireshark, it's, uh, so the question is, uh, the question was, uh, would you have to run Wireshark as a sudo? Uh, so it's not advisable, but it solves many problems at once, creating some other bigger problems. But uh, <laughs> it does, it does get the job done. Uh, why don't you run Wireshark as sudo? Uh, Wireshark not only captures data from the network, which it needs privileges for, but it also processes them. And these so-called dissectors, which allow you to visually see what you see on the left here. Um, so each line here is provided by a different dissector. It actually allows you to see what's inside the protocol. And you can take a look at that later, much later on. Uh, are written by many different people, lots of them. And there are bugs. Man. And you don't want bugs in your program you run as root, right? Especially if it's taking live data from the network. Uh, all the data. Anyway, if there are no more questions at this point, let me continue. So on top we have each frame, each packet, it depends on what, what that is, but basically each piece of incoming data on the wire we have here on top. On the left in this view we have dissected data. So it's processed data and we can take a look at what what. On the right we have raw data, this is the whole frame. And the cool thing about this is if you click anywhere on the right, it will show you the matching part on the left. So it actually shows you which byte is what. This is quite cool. But we don't know what that is, right? It's, uh, it's some jumbo mumbo or mumbo jumbo. Let's, uh, let's get back to the presentation. We're going to work with that a bit. Let me switch back a little bit quicker than previously. Okay, so for capturing data locally, that's what I just did. Um, for this workshop, I hope your neighbors will help you up setting this up. Then you do that at home, and usually it's, it's useful after after you've been to the workshop to go back at home and, and, and try to repeat it, so you actually don't forget it. Uh, different hardware. If you want to capture the data on the wire, not only data that goes to your computer. For example, now I capture the data that goes to my computer. You can capture, capture all the data that is received by the network interface by layer one. Uh, you need to make sure to enable promiscuous mode. Um, and 
it means that your network card does not drop packets that are not addressed to you, or frames that are not addressed to you. Um, that means you can get to see other stuff on the network or on, on the Wi-Fi. Uh, we're going to probably take a look at that later on in, in two hours. Network card drivers have to support this feature. Uh, most do. If they don't, for example, for, uh, for Wi-Fi, I recommend, uh, I recommend these TP-Links. Quite, quite good. This is TLWN722N. Uh, it's, it's only 2.4 gigs, but uh, it gets this job done if your built-in do not support it. Wireshark can also be used to capture other network data, like USB data, GSM data. Um, some of these may require additional tools, meaning that you will not usually be able to capture GSM with Wireshark directly, but there is a cool project, Osmocom, which you can... Uh, who knows Osmocom? Some do. Good. Which you can install and configure, it's a pain, but it, uh, it works nicely after you do that and you have the right hardware. Of course, you can't do that with this one. This is 2.4 gigahertz. GSM is uh, just under gigahertz. And then you can capture it and, and dissect it. Right. Just to cover a bit more advanced stuff now, we are not going to try it, but you might be interested in, in the future. So let's say you have a larger network, or let's say you are not at the network at the time at all. You're in a different place and you want to capture the data remotely, or rather you want to dissect the data remotely, you want to take a look at it. Uh, for example, you're renting a server in, in a server room somewhere in uh, Amsterdam, and you're not from Netherlands, um, and you need to debug what the hell is happening there. You have multiple options depending on the network between where you're capturing and where you are. So if you're close, you can use port mirroring. That's a feature on switches where you say, I want all the other ports from the switches, so the holes you plug the wire in, right? Uh, go to this port too, and then you also get the data. Uh, so if you're on local network, that's a, that's a feature you can use to get the data. You can use uh, some protocol. For example, Plasman sniffer protocol can be used, and that can be used over long distances. I think it's UDP, meaning it might lose some data. What it means, we'll get to that in, in some moments. Uh, but it basically forwards everything to an IP address on the internet, so it can be used over longer distances, but it's not encrypted. In case um, you're okay with not getting live data, you can use the command down below, TCP down. This specific command, what, what would it do? This specific command would, uh, would take interface called Ethernet 0, at 0, and write all the data without size limitation. So 64K is, is the largest size you can have. Uh, without size limitation to file blah.cap or .pcap. And then you could open the file with Wireshark. Let me show you that right now. Size here and the file you write it to. And the secret passphrase, it's secret 123 if you, oh, sorry, <coughs> never mind. Permission denied. Okay. Okay, so apparently, yeah, almost some team PO on the classic. Don't allow root to write there. Whatever, however, that happened. Classic. Uh, okay, uh, so currently I'm writing uh, to test cap. I think that's enough. Now, when you launch Wireshark, you can also click file open here. You can go to your TMP folder, uh, test cat, here it is. You open it up, and there we have it. We have basically the same information, same layout, but it's not real time. And this time here on the left is relative to the start of TCP dump, not relative to start of Wireshark. And uh, we have stuff here, right? We also have visual clue here. This is a feature of a newer version. If you have an older one, you will not have this on the right represents what you have on the left, but, but you see everything. Um, 
Okay. We still, some of you, most of you probably still don't know what the hell all this is about. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna move forward and talk about what this is about. This is gonna be the most academic part of the workshop. So if you are an academic or like academics, this is the time for you to listen carefully. Okay, I should have put a nice wallpaper. I'm gonna do that for tomorrow's talk. Right, so these are these are the models. ISA OSI model is on the left there. It consists of seven layers of encapsulation of the way to look at data. The DOD4 model is on the very right. It says network, internet, host to host and process. There's just four layers. <coughs> it doesn't mean that anything on the network changes. If you look at, I mean, if you have the data, it's there. It doesn't mean that stuff changes. It's just a different way to look at it, okay? And what do layers actually mean? What do they represent? So if you connect a measurement device to a networking medium on the very bottom, you will have some kind of signal. For example, you might you might see electronic signal on the Ethernet wire. You might see optical signal, intensity of light on optical wire. For radio signals, you might listen on a specific frequency and you might also hear some intensity on specific frequency and the frequencies around it. That's all there and all the layers are in there. The question is which layer do we look at? How do we interpret the data? The data doesn't change depending, the data on the wire does not change depending on the layer that we are looking at, okay? And I hope you will understand at the end of this presentation what are the reasons for having the layers and, and, and looking at them more differently. Okay, we're gonna use the academic model, the isa OSI model for this presentation. Uh, DOD model basically, it's, it's more down to earth. It's, it's a bit more simple. It, it, it encapsulates, uh, sorry, it joins multiple layers together in, in, in less layers because uh, even even when working with uh, isa OSI model, these three layers, uh, you can see they're in the same color. It's hard to distinguish them at times, depending on what the protocols are. The great success of the model, and the model does not influence what's on the wire, but it influences how academics and practitioners create protocols for the internet. They look at the model, and the great success of the model is that it's layered, <laughs> meaning you can basically swap up, swap up swap out one layer and everything else can remain the same. For example, if we swap, up the swap out the physical layer, um, we can still have an IP address. It doesn't matter if you have Wi-Fi or if you have wire or if you have optic, ca optic cable, you still have the same IP addresses. Theoretically, for DNS, for example, the main name system, we can look at that later, we can swap, up the, swap out the transport layer. It can change UDP to TCP. And we still have basically the same protocol on, top, on layer 5 and same protocol below on layer 3 and, and down. <coughs> Each layer can be swapped out mostly independently. Meaning that internet can evolve, we can create new protocols and it's easy enough. There are some bigger projects uh, doing some, some larger stuff where they want to replace the whole stack. It's a bit more complex than that. But that's a great success. Moving, moving data from the user on top to the wire on bottom is called encapsulation. There's one encapsulation step between each pair of layers. So going from layer seven to layer six, there's encapsulation, six to five, there's encapsulation, five to four, and so on. Technically, you only need to have the lowest layers. So let's say we capture data at a specific moment in time. We measure the voltage on, on the wires. It has to have physical layer because we measure the voltage, that is the physical layer. If the voltage makes sense in, say, Ethernet 
sense. Um, we can also interpret that it at it as layer two. If that Ethernet frame contains IP protocol, it's layer three and so on, but it doesn't have to go all the way up. As what? we will see in the example with Scapy, yeah, it's it anyway. can stop at any time. This layer is there, depending on what data is in there, and you can, if you have Wireshark on, you can take a look at the data that you can capture. Some dissect, uh, some packets will show you only up to a specific layer. <coughs> right. So let's say I was typing an email. I, I typed my body, my text that I want to send, and I pressed send. So what all the applications and all the firmware your computer does together, it encapsulates it down to physical layer and then the network card takes the raw bits, zeros and ones, and creates a signal out of them, depending on what kind of physical layer you're on. Encapsulation usually includes adding a header to data from the upper layer. So let's say your email text was really short. Let's say it was hello SHA, right? Hello space SHA. Encapsulating it one by one, or layer by layer, you would add additional data. It's, it's usually binary data, so I can't really pronounce it to you, but let's, for, for the sake of argument, let's take, it, let's take some simple numbers. At the transport layer, it might be 777, hello, SHA. At the next layer, it might be 356, 777, hello, SHA. It will add more mm -hmm. and more data, more and more metadata with every encapsulation. For some layers, it will also add check sequences. It depends on specific protocols that we're going to look at, but there are check sequences that ensure yeah, that the data the of the upper layer has not been corrupted when being transferred. Oh, this is confusing. So so this is basically encapsulation. If, if anyone asks you what encapsulation is, it means taking the upper layer data, adding some stuff to it, and then passing it down to the lower layer. There's one more thing, decapsulation. <coughs> anyone knows or thinks they know what that is? Right, decapsulation is the process the other way around. You have your you have your bits here. They're decoded and then they're decapsulated. You check the uh, check the check sequence if there is any. You ch you do what you need to do with the headers. Sometimes, for example, the promiscuous mode. Right, you remember that. If you don't have it on your network card, check the header, check the MAC address. We're gonna talk about the MAC address later, and discards the frame and doesn't pass up, it discards it, depending on what the metadata here is. So something is done with the header, and if it's all fine, the data is passed up. Um, please watch me carefully. So this data here decapsulates to this here. So all this is considered data on the lower layer. Again, uh, all this, uh, sorry, all, all this is considered data on the lower layer, right? Encapsulation and decapsulation. Okay. Um, shortly back to the academic part of the presentation. Correct names for the packet data units for each layer are physical layer, those are bits, data link is frame, network is packet, and transport is segment. Uh, and here just data. Just in case you were wondering. Uh, technically, with what I do here today, you might be able to pass half of CCNA one course. You can try the exam later on. <coughs> I don't have much to say about the physical layer. I mentioned the different physical, and let's walk around so everybody can see. I'm, I mentioned different physical layers uh, multiple times already. So academic definition of physical layer is that the goal of it is to specify the electrical, mechanical, procedural, and functional requirements for activating, maintaining, and deactivating a physical link between and systems. There are some keywords there that are actually important and that actually make sense. Actually, all of it makes sense to me. Uh, but electrical means physical layer deals with voltage levels. It, it deals with which voltage level is zero, which one is one. Physical means it deals with what kind of socket there is. So if you want to plug in a cable in a, in a port, sockets have to match, right? And so on. The physical link between end systems means that physical layer only works between systems on the same network. 
with wire it's simple. You have wire, you, each wire has common end, two. And if you cut in half? Still two, what the? One. Nice, wieso? You cut, you cut a wire that has two ends in half, how many ends do you have? Yeah, that's you still zwei, have two ends. Zwei. Four ends. What? Four ends. Hey, <laughs> anyway, he's got two wires. <laughs> So, wenn man ein Kabel no, just, just halbiert, wonder. hat man noch Sorry, zwei Kabel mit zwei Enden. Okay, Alter. so a wire, however, how many times you cut in half only connects two systems, right? So it's it's a physical link between two systems, two network interfaces, two cards. Uh, it's a bit different with wireless, but wireless still we can talk about physical link. We have an access point, and we have all the devices that are physically connected to that interface using that medium. Medium for wireless is the radio spectrum. It's basically the electromagnetic band is available for using for using the radio. And it's it's that physical link between end systems. So on the physical layer alone, we cannot transmit further than the physical cable goes. If you put a switch in between in order to make a cable larger, the physical layer ends with a switch. Switch, by the way, is called the layer two device because it operates on layer two. We're gonna look, take a look at layer two right now, and we're gonna see what that what that is. A switch layer two device. It breaks down layer one and it operates at layer two. It also breaks down layer two, but it recreates it for communication to happen. Oh, we're still looking at layer one. Sorry about that. So layer one actually consists of two sub-layers, continuing with the academic, academic part here. Uh, the data link layer is responsible for delivering the messages to the proper device. Meaning that there's some kind of identifier in the data, data link layer that can be used by networking equi equipment to route, well, route is not the correct term, uh, but to manage the direction of the data. No, this is layer two. My apologies. Yes, layer two. Right, layer two consists of data link layer and, uh, and the MAC layer. So data link layer also formats the message into data frames and adds a header. And it contains these addresses. It contains the destination address and the source address. Now, only for Ethernet, only for Ethernet those are called MAC addresses. Only for Ethernet. There are different layer two protocols than Ethernet. Ethernet is the most accessible one for most of us. And data link layer consists of these two layers, MIDI X control and logical link control. Ethernet is one of the protocols that can be used on layer two. Here is uh, a small example on your right. It's a so-called Manchester encoding. How many of you know what Manchester encoding is? Cool, we have uh, four and a half rows. Nice. <coughs> um, the real question is, why is it used? I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk about Manchester encoding uh, per se because it's, uh, it's actually used up to 100 megabits wired, if I'm not mistaken, 100 megabits, 100 base D. Uh, so it's not, not, not so popular anymore. Uh, but uh, the idea is good and it can be used when designing protocols of such a low level. The idea behind Manchester encoding is to build in a clock into data. So what is a clock for low level protocols? Remember, we have these two devices, let's take a simple case, we have these two devices with wire in between them. And the device A wants to send to device B data 10100111001, right? What if device A wanted to send 1000 zeros in a row? How would device B know that those are 1,000 zeros, not 1,001 zero? What if they wanted to send a million zeros? Clocks between devices may not match. Clock speed may not match, and it was specifically a problem back in the day, and even currently between different manufacturers, it is possible for oscillation frequencies on the chips to not match. To fix that, uh, an encoding can be used. One of the simplest schemes is called the Manchester encoding. And as you can see, it takes a clock 
of the sending device. It has its clock and it wants to synchronize its clock to the receiver so the receiver knows how many zeros or ones are being received. And it's quite simple really. <coughs> For each clock we have one bit. So clock is on and off, right? The first line. We have one bit. And if the bit is one, it means change the signal level on the wire. This is signal level on the wire. Like you, you can you can look at it as uh, uh, minus five and plus five volts, which is not not correct, but you can look at it like that. Change the level on the wire from minus five to plus five, and for every zero, change the level on the wire from plus five to minus five. And what do we have in the end? In the end, we have oscillations all the time. So if you have multiple ones, we go down and we go back up. If you have multiple zeros, we go up and we go back down. That way, clock gets built in into data stream. It's a uh, it's a good principle that can be used in many many places, right? This way, receiver always knows how many sequential zeros or ones are being sent. <coughs> anyway, this was a bit deep. Uh, let's look at the MAC address. This is something you actually need to use Wireshark correctly. So on on, on layer two, if it's Ethernet, you have a MAC address. It's six bytes, and it's represented by six hexadecimal symbol pairs. Examples on the screen. That's, uh, I think I just made that address up. Yeah, just, I just asked the random number generator and, and there's an address. <coughs> First three bytes are what's called organizationally unique, oh yeah, organizationally unique identifier. It's assigned by IEEE to different vendors of network equipment, including network cards. Well, then there are some people to the east, uh, some countries to the east, who just uh, take them randomly and create whatever others they like. Uh, but it, they should be globally unique, theoretically, but it's not such a huge thing because, remember, layer two only matters locally. Even a switch is layer two device, and then MAC addresses do not matter because we get a new set of MAC addresses. Even though yet they should be unique. The first byte, the 08 is the first byte in this example. First byte is has to end with two zeros in binary, meaning that it has to be divisible by four in decimal. If it's not, then bad stuff happens. Why? Take a look at Wikipedia. It it says that we don't have that much time. <laughs> Stuck. <coughs> Last three bytes. I mean, if, if you if you know everything I'm, I'm I'm talking about, right? You can do your deeper deeper research right now, so you not get bored. Uh, last three bytes are vendor assigned, meaning that if I have a company and I register with IEEE to get uh, prefix zero uh, eight one ec seven, then I can randomly or sequentially assign these numbers to my network e equipment and give them out to customers. And again, these are used to identify devices on the local network. Oh, we're also gonna let's take a look at Wi-Fi here. This Wi-Fi is, is 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 basically one of one of uh, options for the lower layer. This is a neat table I I put together. Uh, so we have different Wi-Fi standards. We have different frequencies for them, and we have different maximum speeds. <coughs> Currently, the newest standard that was approved is actually um, a. Oh, AD was a new standard was, that was approved. I think the year here in this table, if I remember correctly when putting this together, means the year it the first device became actually available uh, for the specific standard. So 60 gigahertz stuff hasn't really worked out yet, but it promises up to uh, almost 7 gigabits per second of Wi-Fi. Mm, cool. <coughs> Modulation is another cool thing. Uh, so OFDM, for example, means orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is uh, <laughs> which is how uh, how the radio spectrum is used uh, to to put the data in. Um, let me give you a simple example. This is quite complex. It it has some uh, tri trigonometry in it. And uh, let's look at frequency modulation. FM radio. You have heard about that, right? Frequency modulation means that to encapsulate data, or let's say your voice, into uh, the radio frequency, change in uh, the pitch of your voice will, will create the change in actual frequency. So there's a carrier frequency, for example, 100 megahertz. 
and I'm going to exaggerate the numbers here, but to send one kind of data, uh, the frequency will shift to 101 megahertz. To send another kind, it will shift to 99 megahertz. Right? That's frequency modulation. Uh, then there's amplitude modulation. None of these are used in, in, uh, in Wi-Fi because they're a bit too simplistic. Amplitude modulation works with amplitude, meaning we have our frequency, we stay there as a transmitter, and we change the strength of the signal. And depending on what data we want to send, we change how strong we are sending it, right? And these, all of these, I think, yeah, combine both these two things and more to work. Then there's Wi-Fi wi wi security. Mm. I actually have a cool slide, I should have put it in here. Um, <coughs> that shows how many Wi-Fi networks in the world by percentage have which kind of security. We have quite a lot of non-encryption Wi-Fi's, which is okay because we have some public Wi-Fi, some cafes where you would like to check your bank account or the bank account of the person sitting <laughs> next to you. <coughs> we have, uh, uh, but when you have these WEP Wi-Fi's, which is a great encryption scheme, it's, it's called, uh, how is it called? Uh, wireless and enhanced privacy? Okay, equivalent privacy. Oh uh, yeah, so it was created some time ago and it can be cracked on my laptop in an active mode, meaning that you send out packets in under half a second. In passive mode, it might take up to a couple minutes. Super, super scheme. So we're not gonna crack that, we're gonna, we're gonna crack VPA2 later on. That's more fun. Um, 802.1x. At this conference here, for those of you who read the booklet carefully, you're using probably the right network, which has 800 point one X encryption, meaning that, well, a user can tell that by entering, by having to enter a username and a password. And that, that's cool because key gets, it's, it's, it's a bit more secure, right? Because for one attacker has to guess both the, <coughs> the username and the password, for, for other, you can't really use traditional offline brute forcing techniques for brute forcing that. Uh, yeah, if anyone has uh, any doubts when you go back, Back home, remember this is a big beginner worship, right? If anyone has any doubts when you get back home, which setting to choose, choose VPA2. Choose VPA2 at home. Uh, you will not be easily able to set up the last one. Choose VPA2 and it, uh, it's gonna be fine. Choose a hard password though. Alright, network layer then. Network layer is layer number three. It goes after layer number two. It is responsible for addressing and routing between devices that are not locally attached. Also we can have a switch in between. I thought I'm a little bit behind. We can have a call internet in between. I don't know. We can have routers in between, of course. The most popular protocol, the most recognizable protocol for the network layer is, of course, IPv6. Okay, IPv4. Mm -hmm. um, so, IP protocol, it uh, decodes as internet protocol, that are the internet. Internet protocol, of course, uses internet protocol addresses, IP addresses, uh, to address. And IP addresses have to be globally unique, for sure, except North Korea, they just take them randomly, seriously. And then, then and for the couple computers that they have, then they can't access some stuff because their national sysadmin uh, chose the wrong addresses. <coughs> right, uh, so you can read the exact definition of the screen. Uh, let me walk here so everybody can read it. IP addresses are assigned hierarchically, uh, meaning that, uh, let's say this camp, actually, I, I have I had so much work, I haven't even looked at, at the IP setup here. I'm just an end user uh, this year. Uh, but I guess, do we have real IP addresses here? Yeah? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that's what I thought. Anyway, uh, so the camp got uh, some some part of IP space, IP address space, and each of us is getting some smaller part, one address of all the space. So it's a hierarchical system. There's a network part and a host part for IP addresses. We're going to take a look at that soon. And then there is IPv4 versus IPv6. Mm. V stands for version. Good question. 
What happened to five? It never happened. Uh, right, IPv4, uh, so the thing is, uh, I don't actually, I'm not sure, but I think IPv4 is the actual version 4. Uh, I think IPv4 stands for 4 bytes per IP address. But uh, IPv6 doesn't have 6 bytes per IP address, it has much more. Uh, but addresses are by far not the only difference between IPv4 and IPv6. It's a completely different protocol, but check this out. Applications still work. Even though we have a bit different TCP and GDP protocols on layer 4, layer 5 and up, same stuff. So that's great. But somehow we still haven't deployed IPv6 too, too far. <laughs> right, uh, those of you who have laptops, uh, you can continue looking at them. I'm not going to show anything right now, I'm going to get back to that later on. But you can continue looking at Wireshark. You might already recognize some of the things I'm talking about. And to do that, if you set up the screen as I showed before, on your left, on your screen, you will see those dissectors. They match layers approximately. Actually, you know what? I, I have to show this so everyone understands. Uh, and then we get back to IP addresses. Any questions so far? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's, it's a quick fix, as I said, with some risks. I mean, uh, I could do a workshop on Wireshark setup, but it's a different workshop, and it would take one hour. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay, so here's my test pickup file. Or it's a, it's a live capture, doesn't matter. Let's take a live capture here. Here it is. Uh, you, can, you can note that I pressed this button here and magically started capturing. So, you already see, you already see some IP addresses here. Some IPv6 addresses, we haven't looked at them yet. Uh, you also can see some MAC addresses. Those are not here, but you can see them here. Uh, and the thing I wanted to show you right now, why it has on the screen, is because in Wireshark, it's the, the other way around. User is on the bottom, and the wire is on the top, right? So this is, well, it's not layer one, but this is layer two, this is layer three, layer four, and layer 5 and up in this case, right? This is the way it goes. We don't have layer 1 in Wireshark uh, because uh, that would take quite expensive network adapters to get that information and what's more important, it wouldn't be useful at all. Uh, well, it would be useful if you're doing layer 1 research and attacks on layer 1, so I guess some people have that, that equipment, we don't. Um, so instead of having layer 1 here, what Wireshark does is it puts all the metadata instead of layer one. So we see where it was captured, what kinds of encapsulation, when it arrived, uh, the frame number, sequence number, the length. So it's, it's basically metadata instead of layer one. But we don't really need layer one for most work, including most security research, including most network security research. We don't really need, need layer one um, here. So it starts with layer two here. So again, I want to show you this so you know and it's easier for you to follow. Layer 2 is here, and then 3 goes down, 4 goes down, 5 goes down, and so on. Okay, uh, let's get back to the presentation then. And meanwhile, you can uh, keep clicking around and seeing what you see. So that's an example of an IP address, IPv4 to be specific. Uh, usually when people talk about IP addresses, they mean IPv4 IP addresses, because uh, there's a de facto protocol for layer three on the internet. IPv4 is divided into five classes, A to E, and uh, A, B, and C are generic classes assigned to organizations. D is a special class and E is a special class. D is used for multicast, which is actually, which could be a topic for separate worship. It allows you to send information to multiple devices at the same time, yes. Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. We're talking about the class and we have a slide because of D and D. To understand that those addresses can be used for normal purposes. But of course we're going to be talking about uh, classless routing. So, as I was saying, class D is used for multicast purposes. You should not, and I would guess you cannot in large enough deployments use those addresses and it won't work. Uh, class E is used for R&D, research and development. Those work okay on most, uh, on most applications, uh, even though normal people usually just create a closed network with whatever addresses they want from A, B, and C to, to do their research. Because responsible research is not connecting it to the internet, otherwise your new application, uh, Kronos or whatever, might get leaked and then you get in trouble. <coughs> okay, um, so final thing for this slide is a, B, and C was back then, uh, back uh, 15, maybe oh, it's 20 years ago now, uh, used to actually decide how much computers can be put on the network, on one layer two network. But it's not so important anymore, that's why we had three of them. Uh, currently, it's not being really used. Currently, what's being used is classless routing. And I mentioned briefly before, things. I mentioned the network part of an IP address and the host part of an IP address. Here it is. The red is the network part and the white is the host part. In this specific example, the network part is responsible for identifying which network, which layer 3 network is the device on. The white part, the host part, identifies which device on that network is being addressed specifically. And uh, this is written in bits here, in binary, ones and zeros. Why? It's because that is how calculations can be done until you learn to do it a bit in your head. Network address of any network is network part plus all zeros. So in this case, if we have this IP address and we put all zeros here, we get the network address here. And if we convert that back to binary, sorry, that net mask, <coughs> never mind. If you put all zeros here and we take this number and we convert all of these four parts back to decimal, we get 216391060 and here we get 160. Because we have 128 here, we have 32 here, here and that's it. And that's 116. If you don't know what binary is, put down a note. Later on, go to Wikipedia. It's fun stuff. <laughs> well, not really, but it's, it's useful, really. Broadcast address. That's the address used to address all the devices on the network. That's when you put all the ones in the white part, in the host part. Again, same stuff applies. When you do this last one, you get 128 plus 32 plus 8, sorry, plus 4, plus 2, plus 1, uh, which is 167 for this specific network. Classless interdomain routing notation, uh, 29. What does 29 mean? You might notice that net mask, which is actually what indicates which part is red, which part is blue, is starts with all ones and then zeros. It always does that. Mathematically, it doesn't have to. Uh, in real life, it has. And we could, uh, if we write it down that way, we have all these ones here, right? And it's 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 a waste of space. We have this two by five, two by five, two by five, and then usually zero. Much shorter way to write it down is sitter. We just write down how many ones we have. In this case, we have twenty nine ones. And the same thing is saying uh, slash twenty nine as two by five, two by five, two by five, two four eight. To, in order to understand networks and work with networks, you need to know both notations. Depending on the tool you're using, you might be required to input or, or the output would be in one or the, or the other form, right? Some more special IP addresses that you might see when working with Wireshark or other network tools. All zeros. That's, uh, yeah, so all zeros. Um, that means default route in most settings. It may mean something else in other settings. But basically, it, it talks about the default route. The device on your network where all data should be sent 
if your computer doesn't know where to send it. That is the default route for, for end devices. Then we have loopback address. It's actually, uh, loopback network is uh, 12700. Uh, loopback address is 127001. For most operating systems, anything will work uh, in, in, instead of one. Loopback address is used to address your own device. So let's say you're on the server. If you try to connect to this IP address, then you will uh, connect to the device itself. By the way, I'm, I'm running this cool challenge. Uh, I've been running it for uh, five years, I think. It's... Uh, hold up, let me, let me make this larger. Gonna need this. Right. Um, so my email is uh, shot 2017 at kirill.org, right? I, the first one who sends me the root password to server back to zero to the tele, uh, gets mate. Gets what? Right. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's take some time to set it in. Okay, we got, we got one person following. That's good. Right. So basically, of course, you can set. Wen? Hast du noch an? Ping. Okay. Tja, I tried. <lacht> ich weiß nicht, ob die Challenge noch läuft, aber ich gebe auf jeden Fall mal wieder auf mit der Challenge. Astreine Arbeit von mir, ne? Right. <lacht> ich weiß doch gar nicht, was man gewinnen kann. Was kann man gewinnen? Right. Uh, get some Mate. Mate? Eine Mate, oder was? Club Mate, oder was? Ja, äh, right. worth it. <lacht> so basically, of course, you can set... An IP address to ich sollte vielleicht, wahrscheinlich hat der Logging an, noch sagen, woher ich komme, oder? Coming from YouTube. Um, ne, von Just Watched Chart Video. Cool. Da freut er sich sicher drüber, damit er weiß, woher diese Passwortversuche kommen, falls er die Passwörter irgendwo im Cleartext speichert. To, to, to loop back. Which means that depending on the computer that you are using to connect to this address, you will get the you will get the same computer that you're on. And uh, finally, we have all ones. This means all nodes on the current network. So we can use the broadcast address here. Oh, I'll put this down. We can use the broadcast address here for the specific network. If we don't know or don't care which network we're on, we can use all ones. It is the broadcast address on the current network. That's how you write it down. Uh, most tools will not accept this form. You cannot, you cannot use this. Um, in Windows, by the way, I think there are multiple ways to write IP addresses. I haven't used it for some time, but you can use decimal form. You can like take all 32 bits and write it as a huge decimal. And, and it will work. You can you can try it out. It worked in Windows 98, which was where uh, when I last used it. Uh, it should work still, I guess. Why not? Last slide about IPv4. Currently, it's still the case. There are some other IP addresses which are reserved. On the open internet, you will not find these three ranges. These are private IP addresses. And because IPv4 addresses are so scarce, we need those private IP addresses uh, because we are lazy, bad people who don't want to adopt IPv6. 
we are using uh, these private IP addresses. And we have what's called NAT, Network Address Translation, meaning that for conferences that suck, you get one IP address and everything else is private, which means you cannot directly connect to every computer on the network. Which, in other words, is why you should have firewall on when on the conference network, because the internet knows you're here. Right, but having these as private IP addresses also means they do not route normally on the internet. If I am at home and I type, and, and some conference has private IP addresses, say 10.10.4.3, if I type it at home, it will not route because it's a private address and it doesn't go uh, through routers under normal configuration. Okay, next, yes, please. Uh, research into the room? No, I think it's not. I think it's not because it's not assigned to anybody, meaning that routers don't, don't know where to route it. You, you would send it through the default route up, upstream, and then when we get to BGP routing, it would, it would drop it. Okay, R. By the way, uh, those of you who have Wireshark open, up, up in the line where filter is, you can type in R three letters, and press enter. Uh, some of you, or most of you, may see something. It's been capturing for some time. This, anyone anyone got something there? Yeah, we have something, good. Um, so the filter, it's more, more, much more powerful than just typing in the protocol. Uh, but currently, you filtered all the data units that contain the ARP protocol, or, or rather the terminated ARP protocol, where the highest layer is ARP. ARP is a protocol that does this basically. Mm. You have an IP address, you go to the MAC address. Why do we need that? We need this because, well, humans don't really work with IP addresses either, but we get to that later. Uh, so you have an IP address, but on the local segment where you are, and in the local segment between the huge route that is the internet and the connection that you're making, we need to know the MAC address. Remember encapsulation? User types their email, it goes down, it goes to layer three, there's an IP address, it is added at that point in the header, and if it goes to layer two, computer needs to add the MAC address if it's Ethernet. In order for computer to know the MAC address of a different IP address, it uses ARP. It, it asks around, who has this IP address? And it only works on local network. And a device that has a IP address responds and says, "Okay, this is my, this is my MAC address." Yes. If you both have the same MAC address. Okay. Okay. Let's look. Let's take a look at that. Let Let's say uh, the most interesting case here is let's say you bought, okay, uh, the country in the east, right, China. Uh, let's say you both bought these cheap Chinese devices and you have the same MAC address, which shouldn't happen because. Uh, all, all Ys are assigned by IEEE, but some companies just take it at random. Uh, most of your devices will think that it's addressed to them, and the first one to respond will actually be the one that computer registers and puts in the ARP table. Oh, my, mine does. Uh, well, semi-random doesn't really help because uh, let's say you want to leave the first three bytes the same and you want to randomly change the uh, last three bytes. Some other person in the network might actually have that MAC address because the vendor has assigned it to someone. <coughs> With random IP addresses, there is this risk that you might run into similar uh, into equal MAC addresses. Sorry, I said IP. With random MAC addresses, there is this risk that you might run into the same MAC addresses. Uh, but then you just, uh, if, if stuff doesn't work, you just... Uh, that takes the next MAC address, uh, right? <coughs> but anyway, the other case is when the IP addresses match. Uh, you know what? I, I made a mistake there. So <laughs> the explanation I gave to you was about IP addresses. If two computers have the same IP address, the first one that responds to their MAC address is the one that goes in the table. If two computers have the same MAC address, uh, well, we have a problem because they both of them think that that uh, they are it's for them. They're both responding, and we have this extra traffic all the time. And depending on the timings, each time a different frame uh, might be picked up by the destination. 
but you can try it out. Create a net network. Uh, there's equipment all around. Don't use the equipment connected to upstream. Don't screw it for people who want to use the internet. Uh, take take some switch somewhere. Connect a couple computers or organize and and try it out. <coughs> this R thing, the first one, right? Having different IP addresses, uh, having different MAC addresses and same IP address can actually be used for attacks, right? Uh, I think we have a slide in there later on, but basically the idea is, uh, let's say you want to attack someone and you want to, in a simple case, make sure that when they connect to this IP address, they talk to you. You, you just have to be super fast, you have to even be preemptive, and you have to send our reply to them saying, this IP address is me, not, not that guy. And the computer will believe it. There's no encryption, no verification, no signing for ARP. And to verify that, you can actually use Wireshark and you go inside, you can go inside ARP, you can click on it and you can expand all the fields that are in ARP, you will see there is no such thing. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what, on your computer? <coughs> so, remotely modifying the ARP table is just that. You send the ARP reply and it does that. If it's empty at that point, if the IP address is not in the ARP table. Um, luckily for an attacker, ARP table is being flushed, uh, well, entries expired in ARP table quite regularly, meaning that you have it. enough options to do that. Uh, to locally modify the ARP table, use the command ARP. I think it's both on Windows and Linux and uh, probably Mac too. Uh, so you can use that to modify it locally. And I do appreciate your questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and, and ask them. And I'll try to remember to repeat them because I, I forgot that all the time. ICMP. Uh, Internet Control Messaging Protocol is a management protocol. Um, it is used in conjunction with IP to inform the source of the packet that something went wrong. Here are some examples. TTL means time to live. And it's implemented inside uh, IP protocol to avoid routing loops. Each time a packet crosses a layer three device or a router, the TTL field, and you can find it in an IP packet. You can type IP in search and, and take a look at some IP packets. Oh my God, das Teil jetzt noch gebaut? Every time it crosses a router, TTL gets decreased by one. Uh, the initial Krieg value depends on the existence of oh It's usually no more than 32. Ach, da unten ist ein Ding. Sterbe ich, wenn ich And if you cross the number of routers that you have TTL set to initially, then uh, your packet gets dropped by the next router and Router creates an ICMP packet saying TTL exceeded and send it back to, to the source, knowing that there was either a routing loop or the packet was too, uh, either a routing loop or the route was too large, too long. By the way, um, as I said, I, and again, I'm sorry that I, I was a bit too busy and I didn't go through the presentation again today, so I did that a week ago, and I might tell you something that's in the slides later on, but let's risk it. L router tell you then twice did not tell you. Let me show you an example. So, just to show you what routing is. Ich lade noch die Kühe in dem Chunk, oder? So wie hier der Server am Sack ist. So I'm specifying max hops here, so how many routers can go through? Let's say 60 for this case. Well, uh, we can, yeah, let's say 60 for this case. Trace route is actually a bit different application. And uh, actually, um, I'm gonna show you the Wireshark is quite interesting. So trace route is used to identify those devices that your packets go through when going for a specific destination. And it's done in quite an interesting manner. I'm gonna set up the capture here. I'm gonna launch the trace route. Right, there we are. It's done. So you can see these ICMP packets here. You can you can run the same on your computer, sure. You choose different domain um, and then run it. So a packet is sent to the destination IP address 
that I chose. And in IP field, TPL is set to the minimum value, in this case 1. The first router decreases the counter and looks at it and says it's 0 and sends back TPL exceeded. And this here is the first router's IP address because it is the device that sends us the packet. Uh, then my computer sends it again, but in this case it says, uh, that's probably repeat. Naja. Oh, there we go. Uh, also wirklich safe ist es nicht, was ich hier äh, In this case, I get the same reply for a different device. That way, I can get the list of routers. You can see them here. Oh, it's not repeat. It's actually route configuration this way in the network. Uh, we can get the list of routers that the packet goes through when going to get the address. Uh, oh, yes, please. Ich wollte das Minecart holen. Wo ist denn das? If you get star, that means specific device is sent not to reply with ICMP to you. Or it is set to filter the specific protocol that you are sending. So here, for example, uh, TracePass uses UDP protocol on some specific ports. Technically, you can use this with any type of protocol. You can do this TDL trick. And there is, uh, what was the name, um, um, HPing3, which allows you to do all these tricks. And it's uh, a bit complex, but it's fun. You can use different different type of packet to send it. Um, right. So let me show you. Okay, ich muss kurz das Video rauspacken. Um. Oh mein Gott, welches war denn das? Das ist noch ein Anfall auch. Okay. Ich hoffe, ich war eingeloggt, als ich das geschaut habe. Du uh, ist schon eine Weile her, ne? Da ist der. Die Goldfarm. Guide. Habe ich das mit den Coils danach gemacht? Der hier war es, oder? Nee, das war in der Lab ist nicht drin. Oh, fuck. Ich sag's euch gleich, wird Nacht und ich werde eh wieder von diesen fliegenden Dingern runtergesnackt hier. Ich sag mal fix, solange noch Tag ist, hier mir einen Safe Room bauen. Okay. Jetzt soll ich das Video neu suchen. Ich weiß noch, dass ich ewig gebraucht habe, um dieses blöde Video zu finden.
Okay, you know what? Ich such's neu. Es kann sein, dass ich da nicht eingeloggt war. Eigentlich unwahrscheinlich, aber egal. Ich weiß gar nicht, ob ich schon Thumbnail erkennen würde. Leute, wisst ihr was? Ich mache gleich meine alte Folge an, wo ich gestorben bin. Okay, das mache ich jetzt. Ich sowas. Ich baue das jetzt von meiner alten Folge einfach ab. Tja, welche Folge war das? Äh Scrollen wir mal hier durch. Hier, das sieht doch richtig aus. Programming defensively. Ja, hier bin ich tot. Nice. Okay, Folge 73. Lol, die hat nur einen Ru Aufruf. Das war die geilste Folge, Leute. Okay, hier sieht man die ganzen Maschinen. Das ist super. Okay. Ist ja mal das Computer, wie ist denn das Teil gebaut? Also wir haben auf jeden Fall hier so ein Dreieck mal. Ähm ja, Dreieck hier, ein bisschen tiefer. Richtung machen wir das ist eigentlich egal. So. Ja, das ist jetzt spiegelverkehrt. So. Und dann ist, glaube ich, hier unten noch ein Dreieck dran. Ja, das ist jetzt wieder so rum spiegelverkehrt. Okay, wir machen hier ein Dreieck. Und ein So irgendwie sieht es aus. Ne? Und dann... Und irgendwie, ich glaube, da hinten... Ja, ja. Da hinten kam der... Der Korrebaum hin. Let me show you one cool dress here. Der TNT kommt schon recht am Anfang, oder? Oder kommt der TNT da? Nee, der kommt schon direkt da hin, gell? Und die Blöcke um den TNT rum sollte ich auch so schnell wie möglich wegmachen. Und hier keine Updates mehr rein snacken. If you actually go to the dressbad.course, uh, there's a cool song. Don't play it here because I need to speak, but uh, you can, if you have headphones, you can put on or play it later. It's, uh, it's the, these are the lyrics for the song. And that's the face expression the guy makes at, at the point. <coughs> um, okay. Right, uh, let's continue then. Wahrscheinlich sollte ich nicht die Maschine aus dem Video so von mir nachbauen, weil das hat überhaupt nicht geklappt, oder? Create a parallel network, which means it's not that easy to have it together with IPv4. 
it works with layer five and up protocols the same way, but layer three it replaces completely because it's a different layer three protocol. And that's why it's so hard to deploy it, I guess. It has that many possible addresses in theory, which is, you c c can you read it for us? No, no, I can't read it. Okay, that, 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 that's fine. Uh, so it's a bit more than uh, 4 billion addresses in, in IPv4 that we have. Uh, we have one IP address for every person on the planet, every device they have, every port that device has, and every service that might want to run on every port of the device, and, and more. Uh, an example of IPv6 address you can see on line 3. Was there a question? No? Okay. Uh, you can see on line 3, and uh, it's quite long. So what you can do, and it's a standard, in IPv6, when you type in IPv6 addresses, you can concatenate it. You can find just one. If there are multiple, you can find just one place when there are all zeros, where two bytes, two, two bytes of the same part between the semicolons are, between the columns are zeros, and you can remove them all. So this is a whole, these all are, are zeros, we remove them and leave two columns, and that's it. And that's a bit easier. I actually, a year ago I had this IP address, and then uh, 6.net shut down, it's a tunnel broker. Yeah, and I don't have it anymore. Yes, exactly. Uh, but, but the idea, I mean, the principle is still the same. We have network part somewhere here, and we have a host part somewhere on the right. So usually if you start your host at low numbers, you will have some zeros there. And it is actually helpful. But you have to understand this is the same address. Double, the other way around, double columns means you put in blocks of zeros until the length matches, right? Until you have uh, 16 bytes. That's it about IPv6. Yes. No. Layer 2 stays the same. MAC addresses do not change. Thank you for your question. Okay, the next layer is layer... F oh, the question, please. I did not. Uh, well, let me show it to you. Okay, here is uh, IPv6 magic here. And here is some IPv4 not magic. Right. So, first of all, uh, we can, well, it's not visible here, but uh, I think the, oh, TCP okay, protocol glaub, is different. Part can so, uh, so if we look at uh, IP version 6, fliegen lassen. we can see different headers than IP version 4. Take a look here. Uh, the router advertisements is a new thing for IPv6 too. Uh, it's quite specific, to be to be honest, right? Uh, for this audience, but if you take a look, it's uh, it's, it's it's way different, right? Uh, again, Wikipedia. I have uh, I have a different slide deck for IPv6, but uh, we have only how much time do we have actually? One hour and a half. Okay, one hour and a half, and we are uh, in the middle of the deck, and we have met demos, demos, demos. Huh? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, but thank you for that. Okay, so transport layer. <coughs> transport layer, as the name suggests, is responsible for transfer of data in oh a reliable no, oh manner. No. It's responsible for the data to arrive at the destination in order and error free. And this is because IP, the most recognizable layer three protocol, is a packet switch protocol. Ach, das geht echt zwei Meaning runter. that the router okay. that we have in between two endpoints, ah, they can switch gebaut? the route that they're using for every packet. Oh my they're God, not bound so schief, by any law to send all your packets for the same stream through the same route. 
they can change like that. And that's why you have transport layer. It does some buffering, among other things, and yeah. receives uh, the packets and rearranges them in the original order. That way, if you send a long text that doesn't fit in the packet, you can actually so arrange them back in the right order. Bus. This has to deal with TCP, mostly. Just transport control protocol, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Is this station here, rausgerutscht? so two types of uh, layer for protocols, connectionless and connection-oriented. Uh, connectionless meaning uh, meaning that we can just send data and that's it. We don't need to agree on anything. We can send the first packet and it's already data. Connection-oriented means we have to set up a connection in some way or another. Here is UDP. UDP is nothing what uh, what, what layer 4 is about. UDP is basically there uh, to fill the void because there needs to be a layer 4 if you want to have layer 5. It's a best effort protocol, meaning it doesn't care about errors, it doesn't care about delivering data. This is everything there is. Header consists of these four fields for UDP. And then data. Data is uh, layer 5 stuff coming in there. Notable features of UDP, user dedicated protocol, is minimal design as you can see. It doesn't retransmit data if it's not delivered, it doesn't care. It just sends the next part. And it doesn't control delivery of the d data either. It is stateless and transaction oriented. So it doesn't keep the state of the connection, it's not a connection oriented protocol. All oh right, the fun demo, yay. Ich verstehe nicht, muss ich, ich muss irgendwo gegen das Minecraft gestoßen sein oder so, dass das da wegrutscht. Ich, ich weiß nicht, was da los ist. <lacht> Irgendwas ist da ganz komisch. Okay, so what we have on the screen here is a theoretical setup. We have the internet in blue and brown, the globe. We have two firewalls depicted by the icon of fire and the wall. And we have two relatively modern PCs. Um, there's A, X, Y and B. That is the setup. Each of them have an IP address. Um, do anyone notice anything special about any of the IP addresses. Okay, which ones are the private IP addresses? That's correct. A and B are the private IP addresses. Um, so, if computers A and B would like to communicate without any third party, they would have no way of doing that. But UDP and the specific arrangement allows us to do that. <coughs> Um, so what we can do is uh, we can take computer A and we're gonna send connection from computer A to IP address Y. Router or firewall Y will drop will drop the packet, will drop the UDP. Uh, the UDP. Um, what's the actual correct term for UDP? Segment, right? Will drop the UDP segment. Um, then, computer B, and the thing about this, they all, they both need to communicate, they have to know that they have to communicate. Uh, other than that, it works magically. Uh, B will send data back to A, back to X, I mean, and X will already know where to send it. Why? Because when computer A sends the data to B, a connection entry is created in the firewall X. And it says that, okay, so if A wants to communicate with IP address Y, I know where to send it back. Let me show you how it works. Okay, so I have some IP address here. Right. And I have um, 
let me connect somewhere. Um, let's see, where would we connect? What is this? LV. Cool. Um, okay, so both these uh, computers have firewalls. Those are not private addresses, uh, but there are firewalls which will not allow us to connect to them. I'm gonna. So the left one is my computer, the right one is my server. I'm in a different country. Um, so this command will listen for UDP packets on port. Uh, Two, three, four, five. I forgot my IP address. And now, if I try to try to connect there on port uh, which I also forgot, two, three, four, five, I shouldn't be able to send anything because of the firewall. Well, I hope I didn't lie to you about the firewall on the other side. Let's try it the other way around. And I'm going to try to connect from this side. Sure. And the data doesn't go through to it even it even sends a reset. Um, so as you see, the data didn't go through. Now, what we can do to make these two computers talk together, even though there are firewalls, in this case, in my computer's case, on my computer, and in, on server case, on the network, how do you make them communicate without reconfiguring the firewalls? Um, I will now write the commands again. From here, I will connect to the server on port, say, 888, using EDP, it will not work, of course. On the server, I will not listen. Rather, I will connect to my IP address here on this network on the same port. I will also specify the source port, which the packet is coming from, which it is going to be sent from, and they match. Um, let me, uh, it's not, okay, Wireshark isn't helpful, uh, okay. Uh, we do, oh, minus U, UDP. We do this. So, UDP is connectionless protocol, meaning that when I launch this, nothing has been set up yet. Only when I send the first packet will actually any data be sent. The first packet will be sent from the server to my laptop, and it will not reach it because of the firewall. But at this point, the firewall at the server side knows that the server side can communicate on port 888 uh, with that IP address. My firewall doesn't know anything about it. Now I try to communicate to the server. I already got data through. And now, as I send this 45667, my firewall knows that I want to communicate with the server on port 8888. And it will think that data coming in is part of that connection, not the other connection. There are actually two connections in, in quotes, of course, because EDP is connectionless. But now, we can actually communicate between the two devices on UDP. Yes, it, it, it can be used, and uh, oh, oh, thank you very much for reminding me. The question was, is this one of the techniques that is used by peer-to-peer -peer networks when the endpoints are behind uh, NAT, behind network address translation? Um, it can be used, and I actually read, read some papers that say it is being used. I haven't verified it myself personally using Wireshark. Um, one part is missing here, of course, from this demo. How did the host know to communicate? And uh, one way is to use a stun server to establish the connection, 
just to make sure that the other part knows that you want to communicate and what port you want to communicate on, third party server. But it's, it's not as fun, but it's, it is what, uh, what most peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, programs use. They use a stun server. There's actually research, and it's been finished, it's, it's, it's done, uh, that allows you not to use any third party service at all and let the other party know that uh, you want to communicate. I don't have a demo for that. Uh, you can uh, you can Google it. It's Pwnat, P-W-N-A-T. It's, it's implementation of this. Basically, the basic idea go goes like that. Um, a host is pinging an non-existing IP address. In the paper, it's one, two, three, four. Um, and the other part, the other host that wants to communicate at any time sends ICMP reply saying something like, saying for example, uh, sorry this IP can't be reached or, or sorry temple exceeded. And routers and firewalls will send that reply through because they think it's a legitimate reply to your uh, pings to trying to connect to 1234. And that way you can pass data on, you can initiate the connection, you can get the data running. Okay, if there are no more questions here, uh, let's look at the more complex protocol TCP. TCP is stateful and connection-oriented, meaning it preserves states between different packets. It, it uh, has some information and the information stays there during uh, the communication. It has quite a lot of possible header fields here that can be filled, but notable features include, I'm going to start from the bottom, flow control, meaning the other the other device can inform uh, the sender that it needs the sender to go slower or faster. There are different devices that use IP. Um, nowadays, especially nowadays, we have fridges, we have light bulbs, and we have yes, so irgendwas falsch gebaut, right, oder? Uh, and uh, they process data at different speeds. And that's why flow control is so important, especially nowadays. Uh, order transfer, meaning that this actually implements the solution to the problem of packets arriving at different order. We have a sequence number here that's responsible for order transfer. It's 32 bits. Um, Diesmal können es aber auch in der Richtung gelegen haben. It has error detection. It has a checksum here. And it has acknowledgement number here, which includes the sequence number plus one of the packet that was received. That way you can already tell your uh, communication partner, your other device, that you have received the packet. <coughs> and it has three-way handshake, which is the way no. to inform the other party that you want to communicate and establish the initial connection. This is a three-way handshake right here. And we're going to take a look at it in Wireshark, just to learn a bit more about Wireshark. Um, so the client uh, will send a so-called SYN request, synchronization request. Server will respond with ACK and SYN. Client will send SYN, and then we will have ACK from the server. Uh, let's take a look at that live. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna go to google.com with Telnet on port 80. And that's it, I'm gonna close the connection. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. I have no idea. Uh, is it possible? Yeah, please, please find out. We need uh, warm and cozy in here. We can get the campfire maybe going, uh, that would be warmer. Okay, good luck with that. Um, <coughs> Da regnet es ja richtig bei dem Boy. There is some space over there, if he comes a chair and, and over there. Um, okay, so let's continue. That is quite interesting, yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you, a round of applause. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much.
No, I had to show me this, yeah. Okay, there's too much stuff in here. Let's uh, let's do it again. So I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna connect to an IP address so I know how to filter it later on. So what's that? Did it work this time or not? I'm gonna stop the capture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now we know how to filter it. Not here. Okay. So <coughs> one more cool feature of Wirecard that uh, even professionals out here may not use, may have forgotten or never knew. Um, is how you can nicely filter. So, of course, here you can type in different expressions like TCP or UDP, right? But that's not what we want to do. Uh, what we can actually do is, if we choose any field here, for example, the destination address, and we right-click it, what we can do is apply its filter, select it, and we only get the matching packets where this field is set to this parameter. We want it we want to see both parts of the communication. We change that to IP address, not IP destination. Here is our three way handshake. Oh, that's the other teil then in week, that's natürlich ungünstig. And I of course encourage you to follow through and, and also try to connect somewhere and capture it. We can see that Wireshark has helpfully already selected uh, I mean highlighted the flags. Of these three packets here, sin, sin, I can die off and back wieder starten. But let's go in a bit deeper. So, internet protocol version 4, flags. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's not, not flags. Uh, it? Oh, ich right. So sterben, Leute. My bad, TCP, right. <laughs> TCP, TCP flags. These are all the possible flags that you can set. Flags are actually two bytes by the large here, of the left, you can And uh, you can set any combination of flags in theory. Whoa. Uh, in this case, you we have set the sin flag. This is meaning it's a synchronization packet, meaning das kein Dreieck hier unten this IP address dran. here wants to establish a connection to this IP address here on this specific port. Right. The thing I haven't mentioned about layer 4 are ports. Both UDP and TCP have ports, meaning those are channels for communication over the internet. We have the same IP address, we can have multiple services. Port 80 is los, typically I... used Nein. for web, so HTTP. Port 443 is typically used for HTTPS, so encrypted HTTP. Uh, source port is usually assigned randomly by the operating system, unless you specify it manually like we did with NC minus P. Okay, um, so we got the response here. It's, it has sin and accent. And if we pay attention here, uh, those are relative sequ sequence numbers, not the real ones. But uh, sequence number here is set to zero. And in our reply here, acknowledgement number is set to one, meaning that also this time was packet zero rein, was successfully oder? received by the server. And Aber here, das das, das it's setting, auch nicht mehr again, drauf, it's a zero, oder? and we acknowledge it one, saying, okay. And at this point, we can start exchanging data. Here is the bomb material, people. Ach, hey, kritische Aktion, this ganze here. At this camp, there's actually a project being run. Um, that jetzt wird's um, Nacht. Natürlich wird's jetzt Nacht. allows you to scan the whole internet. Uh, it's it's nothing new technically, but I mean the good thing is there's there's a guy who manages it and actually works with the requests you send in and, and runs a scan for you. Uh, Zmap is a tool that can be used for doing that, and Zmap is internet-wide scanner. It scans the whole IP for address space in 45 minutes it, on a gigabit on a gigabit connection. If you have a faster connection, you can use Zipier or Zmap that does it even faster. Um, it's actually quite a relatively new breakthrough. I think it's three or four years old, the idea. And it allows you to do that because you are not waiting for the reply. So how it works, simplistically, is it sends SYN packets and masses to all the IP addresses in a specific pseudo-random order. And it uses the metadata, the other parts, of the TCP header to mark that these packets 
uh, that the replies to these packets would belong to the scan. And it doesn't store any information on your computer about what was sent where. All the stores are in the oh my God. list of IP addresses. Oh, shock of his leben. And when the reply comes, it analyzes oh, those that they included and it so can lange. tell you if the port is open or not. So it's quite, quite cool. I'm not going to run it here because I don't have either. Jesus Christ, uh, light. But it is, it is a cool feature uh. and a way you can use knowledge of, your, of networking to create both up. Okay, routing. Mm. I mentioned that mm. time to live is decreased with every hop, with every router that you cross. Routing decisions are taken based on the routing table. For your computer, usually you would have just a default gateway, just one router where all your information is sent to. For internet routers, it's not uncommon to have many different routes you send your data to, and routing table is used there to actually route the data to the correct spot. Three types of routing, static routing, default routing, and dynamic routing is what I will talk about briefly here. Static routing entails manually setting up routes on each router. So let's say you are Google and you want to set up your routers, you connect to each of your, of your routers, I guess, in the thousands, hundreds of thousands maybe, and you set up the routes by typing, if IP address is in this network, send it to this router which doesn't scale really well, but it's easy in the sense that you don't have to know much. You just have to understand basic stuff about IP networking. Default routing is when you set, uh, if, if, is when you set the destination address to all zeros, and it includes the IP address that, the IP address of the router that you want to send all the data to when you don't know where to send it. This is the only thing that is usually used on a laptop. On, on an end device, on a computer. Was dieser Regen cozy da im Hintergrund? Ich weiß gar nicht, ob ihr den Regen hört von dem Video. Aber da muss wohl krass regnen, wenn es so laut ist. So we have some linked local address and last line, we can ignore that. That's a Na toll, das ist noch topic. nicht gewachsen hier. So here, it replaces uh, zeros with default. It's actual zeros are there, let me see if I can get it on the screen. Nope. Okay, there we go. So it says... Oh, that's a fun... I wonder if it's, if it's an easter egg of the network team. Basically it says, by default, you will send everything here. Unless, of course, it's in your network. Lots of data here, we're only going to look at the wireless adapter. It has this internet address, this is the net mask, slash 19. If the device can reach the IP address locally on the same network, by using the math that I showed half an hour earlier, it will send it directly. It will do an ARP request, ask for a MAC address and send it away. If it can't, it will use the default route. What else do we have in the routing table here? We also have here information that, uh, that I just talked about. If your stuff is on the same network, do not route it. Send it directly. And here, this is the Easter egg, I guess I don't... Anyone know what that is? I, I, I seriously don't know, the second line. Basically, I can tell you what it says, I don't know what the meaning of that. So it says that if you want to send if you want to send data to this specific one IP address, you should also route it to the same IP address as everything else. Um, it, it's set by the DHCP from the network team, from NOC, so I don't know what's that about. Unless someone's hacking me, then that's cool. Sure. Okay, any questions here so far? One hour? Okay. Dynamic routing. That's the coolest way and basically the only way to do large-scale network deployment. It dynamically updates the routing tables on the router using routing protocols. Um, so basically, two types you should know about. 
just real quick because it is again a very in-depth thing not suitable for a beginner's workshop uh, but uh, distance vector protocols determine that the route that uses the least number of routers is the best route to use it just tries to dynamically find out what would be the number of hops to each network destination uh, oh, some of those there are RIP or IPFP um, SPF or link state protocols use additional metrics and they try to recreate the topology or uh, the picture of how all the network looks like visually on each router they can also take network congestion into account and make routing decisions uh, for example OSPF uh, would be uh, one of such protocols and uh, these protocols are usually why you might have one packet going one way and the other packet going a different route because congestions and different parameters change and routers or multiple routers might take a different decision on how to route your next packet oh the fun part finally so we went through we went through to recap layer one um, so physical physical layer two most popular one is ethernet on layer two we have mac addresses there they're called frames the parts are called frames data parts we have layer three most popular there is IP protocol um, those are packets and they have IP addresses we have layer 4 um, which has segments and we have UDP and TCP there and now we're up to application level protocol by the way I did the now as I was recapping um, I think Wireshark tries to keep yes not that I think I know Wireshark tries to keep this in order that's because uh, you can see it on the right uh, so the fields are actually here in the order that they come in the data unit. Since we had the four and a half network experts here, why is the destination address first before the source address? If you look at IP, source is first, destination is then. If you look at the right here, right? Destination is after source. For Ethernet, for MAC addresses here, destination is first, and then we have source. If it's not only first, it's actually the first byte, the first bit of the frame is already the station address. Any of the network experts or any, or, or any other people here, why is that? Okay, we, ha we, hear we heard an answer speed. Could you elaborate more? Thank you, very good. So the answer was uh, switch. When you switch, uh, so layer two device, when you try to understand which port to send the frame uh, through, switch can do fast forwarding. It can decide where to move the frame without actually looking at the whole frame. And it has to look at it from the beginning because electrical or whatever signals come, th that's how it's ordered physically. And because we start with the station, it's not the, Mac uh, not the source address switch can take a decision uh, dep depending on the destination address without reading too much bytes from the packet and it is much faster and it's still quite important these days with all the speeds that we have ich falle eh wieder runter oder habe ich hier mein wasser okay uh, where were nee. we aber jetzt sind keine da right so we are up to layer 5 and this is the place where where i will We'll stop going through the layers. I will try to, to do some explanation of differences between uh, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. But it is usually hard to distinguish which is which, and Wireshark dissectors do not try to do it usually. They usually just have one layer there. Uh, what we can do now is we're gonna take a look at some core protocols for the internet, core application la layer protocols, and shortly look how they work which is the last missing part for you to understand how basic stuff on the internet works, technically. So this here is the overview of the DNS system, or domain name system. Um, it consists of the root, root zones. An example of root zone would be .com, well not .com, .com, or LV, or NL or 
course, I guess. Cool domains we have these days. Um, it's a hierarchical system, meaning that um, meaning that if you have a domain signed.bad.course, it is a subdomain of bad course, and that is a subdomain of course, and it entails some administrative features. Before we look at that practically, and those of you um, who already know this theoretical stuff, the command is dig. I'm just going to remind you, dig, you can start playing around with it if you have it on your computers. <coughs> so just some of the DNS record types. What is DNS? Domain name system allows us to not use IP addresses. We already learned how can we avoid using MAC addresses, but people don't want to type IP addresses. They don't want to type IPv4 addresses, even less they would like to type IPv6 addresses. So we have DNS, which provides nice readable names for us. Computers uh, have basically no use for them. It's, it's all for us humans. There are different record types in, DNS, in the DNS system. The main record type is A or four A's, and returns an IP address for a domain. Huh? Why do they not Okay, so oh my God, sind die schnell. A for SHA 2017 org, I will get the answer. Wo? This happens automatically whenever we use an application that supports DNS, which is 99.99% of the applications these days. Uh, we just type in it in a browser or in an email program and we'll find the IP address for you automatically. For an email program, the procedure is a bit different. So for a browser, it will look for a record and will know this is the IP address I need to send my data to. Let's take a look at uh, Wireshark for a moment here. So if I, even if I just ping, which is just sending an ICMP packet to check if the IP is up, mm. It will still need to find out the IP address See, that's not as big of from the order. name I typed here. So if I type DNS here, I will see a query here. It's asking for a record for gmail.com and the response here. Huh? And it has given me here these answers. So these are four of the IP addresses that my computer can use to connect to gmail.com. MX is used for uh, mail exchange, and that is the one used when actually sending an email. So, if we dig, if we dig MX uh, Google.com, this is the answer section. We can see that email for at Google.com is handled by any of these mail exchangers. And if we would like to connect to them, we would need then uh, to get the A record for them, right? And uh, Depending on the configuration, you might also get them automatically from the server, which is which has happened here. It's additional section. It's not what I asked for, but it might be useful. Oh, I skipped AAA, but uh, I think you already see what that is, right? Uh, for A's, you see, I have no idea what I do. Not IP for address. NS record is a name server record. It delegates a zone to use a specific server for lookups. Um, so here, for example, every DNS resolver knows of 20-ish root servers that are distributed all around the globe, but it is basically the one and only part of the internet that is actually the weakest link. Uh, not really decentralized. Even though we have 20 of them, if a hacker, a bad actor, well, yeah, if a bad actor, right, hackers are good. If a bad, seriously though, yeah, okay. If a bad actor were to take all of them down at the same time, DNS would not work globally. That's a centralized, centralization point there. Anyway, each of these servers know, they know where to look up the first, the top level domains. So uh, if we do DNS, ich glaube, ich habe es falsch schon gebaut. Shot 2017.org. 
And if we ask this question to one of the root servers, sorry about that. So I did that by, by typing at and the name of the server or IP address of the server. All it will say to me in this case is which name servers are responsible for the order. Even if I ask not an S, but I ask A, I want the IP address of this, it will still give me only the same answer in authority section. Because the system is hierarchical, those name servers do not know anything about this. Let's use uh, program.sha, which is a very dear address to me. And today I spend, uh, spend four hours trying to fix the, the program CSS. Some people couldn't scroll to the right and didn't see tau and pi. Uh, okay, so we can see the name servers, and what would automatically happen if you didn't specify the specific name server? It would then ask that one of randomly one of the next name servers the same question, and we would get an answer. Hopefully, if it would, if it would not get an answer, it would try the next name server. Hmm. Um, so we have an answer, and again, it's not our answer. It's just an authority section that says. For this domain, mm. uh, I wish I the <laughs> Take one at random. We have the same question. There's our address. It's a CNAME record, canonical name, and alias. It says, basically, it says DNS for this is the same as DNS for this. And again, automatically, server also sends me, by the way, you probably will want to know the A for this, so here it is. So I don't have to ask it again. Yes. To, to what domain? Yes, yes. Yes. Well, I'm not, I'm not the sysadmin, I'm the content team. So sysadmins are doing that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any, it doesn't cause any technical difficulties as far as I could uh, imagine. Uh, I think it's fine. Now that you asked, I'm getting a bit suspicious about it. It's fine to do that. Uh, but I, I would I would also do that if, if needed, yeah, sure. I mean, unless you have really good reason to use a C name, uh, depending on your name server, it's better to use a record directly. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use it. Why why you could avoid C name in situation is because it's on the same domain. This zone, uh, server holding this zone knows the IP address you can send directly. Depending on the server, you might force your DNS client to make a separate request. If I wouldn't have this line here. I would have uh, my, my. I would have to now do do this to get the IP address, which is bad. Yes. Uh, so your, your comment was that uh, you think it's not okay to do that if CNAME goes to a different uh, upper domain. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what you said. Um, well, that's actually th this thing when you put CNAME to a different upper domain, um, say to google.com, uh, is actually the uh, the only real use for CNAMEs. It is, it is not good network-wise because you will have to make another request because this specific network doesn't know anything about google.com but it's, it's a legitimate use. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a legitimate use because that way you can actually um, you can actually link your IP address to whatever this other IP address is. The other admins change the IP address and yours changes too. Unless you want to delegate the whole zone using an S record. Thank you, one hour left, okay. Eine Stunde, yeah, meint ihr, wir schaffen es noch eine Flying Machine zu starten? Unlike CNA, <laughs> which we already discussed here, uh, PTR would stop the processing. Meaning that it's basically a kind of text record. Not exactly, but it returns just the name. PTR most commonly are used in reverse DNS. So when we did the straight route... Also, die hier zeigt mir richtige Richtung, aber die ist falsch gebaut, ne? Course. You, you can notice that we get the names here. But if you watch carefully, Traceroute uses this TTL trick, and those are IP addresses, of course. We are getting answer from an IP address, not the domain name. Also, das kommt hier hin. 
what that means is that this som somehow this gets here. If we run run trace plus minus n, it doesn't do DNS queries. We can see all the IP addresses here. And what it does is actually looks for reverse DNS for every IP address. Um, you can also do it like that, right? You can, you can take this, which is just IP address with all the bytes in reverse order. You can dig it. And here it is. It's just, it just a string, basically. If you, if you just dig it, uh, dig any, to still return it, it, it would not try to resolve it. And that, of course, means that you can type any domain you want in there. If you have the NS server. Yeah, nine, nine. Oh, uh, yes. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, I did it. You feel <laughs> versus now. Uh, I, when I was running the large network, uh, I think I just got uh, around 500 IPs just because of downtime. I, I, I emailed them and said, come on, what's up with downtime every week? And they said, okay, okay, don't be angry here. It's 500 IP for it addresses. And now I have them. But this is, bad horse isn't mine. It's, it's someone else. Um, okay, so we already looked at dig. This is a reference slide that you can use. Um, any is a pseudo record, it's not a real record. It just asks server to send all the records it has. AXFR is authoritative transfer. Um, and it asks to send all the subdomains that the server knows. Usually this is turned off. There was this one or, or maybe two times when a top level domain, like dot something, didn't turn this off and, and some researchers just downloaded all the domains of a country. Um, so you can you should regularly check if if stuff happens, then you can be doing a good job. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's one more thing is plus trace. Let's take a look at that. It's explained here. I already explained this process previously, how your resolver queries the root server, then it queries the name server, then the sub name subdomain name server and so on until it gets the answer. It sends the same query to all of these servers one by one. Uh, plus trace helps you see that visually. My screen is not large enough to show it to you. Just but if you type in your computers dig plus trace program sha 2017.org I will use uh, less to actually fit on screen. Oh boy. Search me danach. Not a good idea, I guess. Okay, let's try this out last. Come to the combine hole. Oh, they have internet? Oh, fuck. Yep. Let's start a different domain. Um. Uh. Okay, maybe maybe I messed up. Sorry, let's, let's put it in the right place. I don't think it matters, but maybe it does. Okay, I don't know what's happening here now. It should uh, it should perform the request one by one. Mm. Right, my name server may be down. Hmm? Let's see. Haben wir hier Wasser ja, unten? Nee, natürlich nicht. Ich habe nicht mal mehr Wasser im Inventar. Okay, ich sollte runtergehen. Dealing with it like everybody else. We need system D. Right. We need the bad guys. It, it unites the community. I agree. Okay, now it works. Um, <coughs> yeah. The right, so this is the request to my lookup server. <laughs> it gives me the root server. No, it's requesting one of thing. the root servers uh, for who knows about org. Who knows about the main, we get the org name server. Then we ask one of those. Who knows about uh, our request, we get the SHA name servers. And then we ask those, we finally get our C name and also the A address here. So that's DNS for you. Oh, SMTP, right, the simple mail transfer protocol. It's simple, it's underlined, that means it's really simple. In the beginning I spoiled a bit about how, how you can uh, forge the return addresses. Well, let me show what I mean. I'm gonna use split screen for this. Ach, Leute, das Leben ist doch ein Kampf, okay. oder? Now let's say we would like to send an email to me. 
my domain is kirills.org. So my mail application, let's say it's a classical mail application, right? Outlook um, would look up the mail exchanger for kirills.org, the domain of my email. There it is. And then we need the IP address for that, technically. And there it is. What happens next is, uh, let me see if I have slides actually in the deck. Oh yeah, I have slides. Let me show you the slides first. What happens next is your computer connects to SMTP server at port 25. That's a well-known port. It gets greeted with uh, hello, 220. You reply with hello and your domain name. Um, you get an okay, 250. You say who the mail is from, like some address that the mail is from. This is the envelope address. Um, you say who the mail is to. Again, you get OK. Then you send data, and then you send the email body with all the headers. Now, this here, this part here, starting from from up to subject, could theoretically be described as presentation layer, so layer six, technically. Uh, but if you don't describe the that and call it whole application layer, it's not a big mistake. It, it, it's uh, quite an academic debate between those three layers. Anyway, you send that. This will be parsed by the email client, not the email server. And that's it. It says, uh, OK, 250. And you quit, and it says, bye-bye, 221. Um, so let's take a look at demo here. So we have the IP address, and port 25. There we go. So Hello. <laughs> OK, pleased to meet you. Um, mail from. OK. Oh, the domain doesn't exist. White hose. Oh, my bad. So, some servers check more, some servers check less of what you actually type. Ah, boom. Sender OK. Good. Uh, recipient. Okay, recipient OK. For recipients, most servers will actually check what the hell are you typing there. So, if a domain would, uh, if an account wouldn't exist, it wouldn't accept it. Also, unless it's an open relay, it will not accept uh, email for other domains. And then data. And now this will be all parsed by my email client if I receive email. Okay. And it finishes the dot online by itself as it's actually sent here in the message. Okay, um, and then we quit, gracefully. That's basically it. Now let me fire my email client and hope that it doesn't go on screen. Okay, it's, it's on my screen, that's a good sign. And, uh, oh look, I have an email. It's not in spam, because my spam filters suck. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna open stuff for you and move it to the screen, uh, to the main screen. Zoom some way or, or another. Um, okay, whatever. Let's look at uh, at headers. So this is everything received. My server added some headers, of course, additional headers that we didn't send. 
but basically it's all there. It it, it says it's from Billy uh, to to admin, and uh, it's all there. Here here it is. Okay, so that's SMTP demo. Needs to flow. Okay, we are at almost the last slide, so we're gonna have the practical stuff soon. Thank you, thank you. Funny the wood. So, HTTP uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Uh, this is a protocol used to transfer web pages. It's not HTML, it's not the markup language, it's the protocol. And uh, rather than doing it in Telnet, you can see how it looks here, this is a response. Rather than doing it in Telnet, let's use Wireshark to, to do that. run this and let's open a page there we go remove the filter if we filter for HTTP we have this request here let's close all this and HTTP is here this is how it looks so we have a um, get request here, meaning uh, open this page, and uh, this is page address, so basically part of URL, it says open the main page, just slash. If I would ask uh, some google.com slash one two three, it would say slash one two three here. Uh, there's a host name, and some headers that identify your user agent, and so on, so if you want to hide, then uh, take note of that. And the response, and here's a cool trick for our shark. Press here, on the packet, and uh, Follow HTTP stream. And we have the stream. We have the request and the reply at the same in the same view. And what's even better if you close it, we can see all the stream packets here visible. Das Teil fährt gleich los, oder? Wenn ich hier irgendwas falsch mache. Okay. Now what they usually do here with a group and uh, this is a small part of a uh, five-day uh, five workshop that I do commercially, actually. Um, what I do here with a group usually is I, I get everybody to launch their Wireshark and open up a web page. It's better if it's HTTP web website, so not encrypted. Just launch Wireshark, close your browser, open Ooh, again, TNT, open up that's a website. Nice. And then we'll take a look at what we see. Um, I'm gonna Den hole ich noch schnell. I'm gonna take two minute break here. You stay right here. Open up a website and I'll be back. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna log this for reasons. Have it's night yet? Me, oder? Jetzt habe ich aber ein gutes Gefühl, dass es klappt diesmal. Ich habe ein gutes Gefühl. Ist jetzt Nacht oder Tag? Keiner weiß es. Jetzt geht das Teil eh in die falsche Richtung direkt los und alles ist futsch, aber keine Ahnung. Ah! 
Oh, ich blase meinen Baum da unten weg. Hm. Passiert. Blöd. Hm. Da habe ich wohl nicht wirklich mitgedacht. Okay, es ist alles mehr oder weniger frei. Oh, ich wollte den TNT noch holen, der da unten liegt. Egal. Hm. Nein, habe ich jetzt ein TNT. Was ist denn da runtergefallen? Was ist denn mit dem Video los? Ich sprung mal ein bisschen vor. Das ist halt echt anderer Black Screen. Kann ich schon springen? Ja. Not for the real thing. Okay, so. Many of you are still here, which is uh, cool. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, I hope you managed. If you didn't, pause any questions before I show you it on my laptop. <laughs> the thing I want you to answer for yourself here. Is what kind of protocols are involved in the simple action of opening a web page. Ich of just typing in an address starten. and pressing enter. Okay, here the NSTCP. What would be the first the first protocol that's employed? DNS, yes, DNS is the one you might see in Wireshark because you've been using the internet or at least your computer has been using the internet. From the theory that we covered, if you would have just turned on your, turned on your computer, what would be the first protocol that you would see after you have successfully and fully connected to the network? ARP, that's correct. Address res resolution protocol. Let's go step by step. Voll gut! And, uh, <lacht> oh Mann, hey, ich hätte auch irgendwo anders runterspringen können. That my computer is just, has just been turned on. Anstatt dass ich ins Wasser springe okay. oder irgendwas. Fuck shit. Okay. muss ich dann komplett lost so I'm deleting some our feathers here let me re relaunch this <coughs> okay and now if I connect to that I'm gonna use my favorite web browser. Links, Ehre. <laughs> There I am. Wo bin ich denn draufgefallen auf den Kackbaum? Auf den hier. Part is there. Yep. So of course we have some background data happening, uh, going on. It starts with ARP. In this case it's because I deleted my ARP table manually, but It, what really happens when you start up your computer and connect my... to the network afterwards. <laughs> so, 
So the full explanation for this is that I typed in the domain 02.lv. My computer knows that the DNS server to use is 8888 because I put it in there manually. Now it tries to connect, it tries to do the DNS. It tries to connect to 8888. To do that, it looks I at the routing table. Well. It all happens in the background instantly. It checks the detonation addresses ordered by the mass. It starts with the most, with the largest mass and goes to, lo to the lower mass. 8888 doesn't match any of the networks. So it goes to the most generic mask and it will send the IP packet to this IP address for routing. In order to do that, the computer now looks at the ARP table. ARP table was oh yeah, empty at the moment. Is so the computer finally sends the first packet. It asks who has this IP address, which is the gateway's address. It's here. Das kann natürlich auch sein, dass der kaputt ist. Ich würde mich nicht wundern. Und es sagt, ich möchte Antwort hier. Der Router, der von Juniper gemacht wird, das funktioniert natürlich mit einem Empfehlung Database. Erinnert euch, die ersten drei Bytes sind an eine Organisation und sie sind so weit. Es sagt, ich bin hier, das ist meine MAC-Adresse. Ihr könnt mich da kontaktieren. Our table gets populated by this information. And now for some period of time, depending on the operating system, the length depends on the operating system, my computer will know that this is a MAC address for that IP address. Now it can finally send the request to 8888. It asks, what is the IP address for 02.LE? And what is the IP6 address for 02.LE? And let's get the response. Now what we will see here Ah, ich wollte eigentlich unten was holen, deswegen bin ich runtergesprungen. Haha, lass dieses Mal nicht sterben beim Runterspringen, oder? Who knows about zero to the TV? And some steps are skipped here. Meaning that Google, 8888 belongs to Google, that's their public resolver. Google does many of the steps for us, and we already get the real name server that will know the answer. This one. By the way, DNS system doesn't support the symbol at. But there are emails in each DNS zones. So if you want to send spam, I hate you. So, but, seriously though, if you take a look at any DNS zone, you can request any type of record. Ah, oh, this thing is on the one, yeah. And if it's set up correctly, oh, we should, we should request start, sorry, we should request start of authority, we can't request any type of record. If it's set up correctly, the second entry here will be the email address. First dot gets replaced by at. Ich das Gefühl, manchmal geht of course, Wireshark does that automatically here. So good. On the right, we can see the response here. Right, um, then... Then to ask for the IP address again. And this time we get the answer here. We get an A record. Now computer finally knows the IP address of the web server. It can start connecting. Please note that for DNS, the usual layer 3 protocol is, sorry, the usual layer 4 protocol for DNS is UDP. As you can see, it's a very simple protocol, just to be discussed in theory. We can see the source port, destination port, length, and the checksum here. There's nothing else. And then there's data, which Flutter already divides for us as a new layer here. HTTP is usually based on TCP. That's why we see our three-way handshake. We have SYN, SYNAC, and AC over here. And as soon as it's established successfully, 
and we can see the sequence numbers, of course, here. We can finally send the data. Oh, I come not even We have our layer two, layer three, layer four, and layers five to seven here. Ah, I can't text 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 and, uh, That's the user agent. Ah, I can't V and S. Drücken. Each TCP packet Sonst gets acknowledged to. This data gets divided into smaller mm. segments because it's a large amount of data and gets sent. Deswegen and each segment gets immer. acknowledged. Okay, here it says that we have acknowledged like that. Server receives it and finally sends the answer. This is reassembled. On the on the wire, you actually see all the separate TCP packets here. Wireshark does it for you. It assembles it back to a response. In the end, server says, "Please close the connection." Fin, and we have handshake for closing. It's acknowledged and it's finally closed. Um, this was summer transmission. It looks like more an attack to me. So, it's a hacker network, right? People are attacking stuff. Um, okay, so this is this is it. That's that. Uh, it's a bit dark to do some of the some of the hands-on demos. Let me show you the last slide. I I worked uh, I worked for two hours on the effect. So look closely, you might miss it. Cool, isn't it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm ready to take any any random questions about. Uh, networking or, or me or whatever. Um, tomorrow evening I'm having a talk on routing the microdig routers. This is this is one of the routers. Yeah, I know that I right now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard to see, okay. Yeah, well that's 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 a pity. Anyway, so we're gonna we I'm gonna talk about jailbreaking these these boxes because you don't get root on them by default. Uh, it's gonna be in, in, in no in the large tent. Um, so yeah if you have any questions about networking I'm here. If you want to take a look at some of the simplistic hardware I have here, you can come and come and take a look at it. It's nothing, nothing fancy. I didn't take uh, Wi-Fi pineapple with me, for example, which is a cool, easy to use device for screwing with people's Wi-Fi. Oh, so yes, any any questions here? Yeah, so viel zu meiner. Yes, uh, you will be able to download these slides over here, uh, depending on how much work I have tomorrow. Uh, probably. On uh, Wednesday. On Wednesday, go there. There will be slides. Yes. The question is: Is it possible for network traffic to not show up in Wireshark? This regards capturing. So, depending on how you capture, um, if you set promiscuous mode, all the if you successfully set it and the driver supports it. All the traffic, all the signals that physically reach your network adapter and are legible, are understandable on, on in layer one sense, will show up on Wireshark. Uh, so there are many ifs. Of course, it, it may not show up. Uh, it may not show up. For example, for Wi-Fi, after any, do we have open network or SHA? Is is there open open SHA network? There is. Oh, I'm going to show you. There is, yeah. Insecure, the open one. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, since we have some time, I'm going to show you a demo after questions with, with, the, with the Wi-Fi, right? A small demo, uh, not not the whole thing, uh, just just to show you how it works. But for the Wi-Fi, for Wi-Fi, for example, uh, for normal network cards, you have to choose the channel, basically the the center frequency, meaning that you will probably not see the other frequencies at the same time. So there are different ifs to, to that. Yes, it is possible to, for that to not show up. I would I would doubt that there is any traffic. It's it's a link local address, and it would not usually show up. Uh, I mean, it, there's usually nothing happening there. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, one more thing is you have all these interfaces, and similarly to as in IP, we have loopback address 127.00.1. We also have a loopback interface on Linux and Unix machines. And loopback data would show there. So if you would do ping 127.0.0.1, you would not see it on your Ethernet or, or VLAN. You would see it on loopback only. Uh, where was the next question? Yeah.
Ach Leute. Oh. <lacht> Jedes Mal. I haven't, I haven't tried it. Thank you. The answer, the answer is yes again. And the question was, can you capture Bluetooth traffic as Wireshark? I know that a couple of years ago, uh, it was, it was, there was an issue. Uh, there's Uber tools, of course, but there was not any, any sensible way to connect it. If you can now, that's great. Can you use Uber tools for, for that? Okay. Yes. So you can use Uber tools apparently uh, to capture Bluetooth traffic. I should, I should try that. That's a fun experiment. I, I don't have it with me. I have this phone. Okay, so if you run Wireshark as sudo, uh, as, as super user, what kind of problems are you opening yourself up to? Potential exploits from I, I did security vulnerabilities in the dissector. Wireshark has this, the things called dissectors. Yeah. Instead of really decapsulating and encapsulating the traffic, it uses a simulation. It mathematically tries to understand what's inside the traffic and show to you graphically. And because of that, combined with the fact that it captures everything on wire, it's quite a high risk that if there's a bug, an attacker can exploit it easily. Because you basically you take everything up from the internet that goes to your device, that goes to your device, and a bug in one of the dissectors running as root may cause remote code execution, for example. Okay, any more questions so far? Yes. Um, this is my first uh, SHA or, or the previous event kind of event, right? I usually attend CCCs. I can tell you what happens in CCCs. Network team comes and confiscates your Wi-Fi device. Uh, sorry, the question is what would happen if you would set your MAC address to the Juniper's MAC address, so the router for our local Wi-Fi. Uh, I hope they have the hardware here. They have that CCC, they, they can triangulate you quite well where you are. They have they have hardware here. Okay. Yes. Did you say Bitcoin? Okay, so the question was. Bitcoin messages appear in two separate packets, always header separately and, and payload separately. And what would be the reason for that? Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at Bitcoin protocol. Yeah, that's anyone. Anyone can comment on that? No. Nope. Okay. And I don't have a Bitcoin client installed, so I can't. We c if I could, if I did, we could take a look and understand. Uh, well, the generic reason would be it's too large. The header is so large that it can't fit. But I guess it's not the case. It's not the case. So, yeah, you can research that, and there are lightning talks. You can do a small research presented day four, day five. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. We have uh, fifteen minutes, right? Twenty-four. Uh, let's say fifteen minutes. <laughs> it's been long enough, right? Um, so those of you that want yeah, to see me to screwing around with Wi-Fi can can stay. Yeah, I'm not promising anything specific. I don't know what was going to happen, but let's try. The machine lives. She does what she wants. Yeah, Leute. I would say that's what we're going to do with this episode. Or is this video over? Ach, no. It's not. What's going to happen now? Oh. Okay, so here's the new Wi-Fi adapter. Ja, aber ich habe auf jeden Fall keinen Bock mehr, Leute. <lacht> Alter, das war, das war mir jetzt zu hart irgendwie. Äh, das Video dauert noch, äh, keine Ahnung, eine Viertelstunde oder so. Ähm, könnt ihr ja gerne fertig schauen. Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Ähm, ich werde es hier nicht mehr on camera fertig schauen, sondern wahrscheinlich off camera. Und ähm, ja, das war es dann von dieser Episode. Mal wieder anders unerfolgreich. Also diese TNT Duping Flying Machines, ich kann sie nicht bändigen. Keine Chance. Mal sehen, was so noch passiert in den weiteren Werbefolgen. Wir sehen uns dann.